All right. So thank you, AIUS and the German Cosmology Society for letting me into this program. Uh, I'll just talk about the angle surgery for glaucoma, aventinotribulectomy. Uh, I have no financial interest in any of the procedures. So glaucoma surgery, you know, is continuously evolving uh, and the trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices are the mainstay of treatment as of now and mostly preferred by glaucoma surgeons. But many new procedures have and devices have been introduced in the recent past and they have shown a lot of uh, promise in controlling intraocular pressure. Uh, as you know, there are a number of devices and basically they seek to drain inside either through the Schlems canal or through the supracoroidal space. Uh, but I'll mostly be talking about the MIGs that uh, involve remo removing or, or incising the typical meshwork to expose the Schlems canal so that the aqueous can be drained uh, easily from like, you know, through the collector channels of the Schlems canal. So aventinotrabeculotomy, so and there are a number of uh, procedures here where, you know, trabecal tissue is bypassed by excision of the, you know, trabecal tissue. So trabectome, Hox dual blade, and gonio assisted transluminal trabeculotomy are the three procedures that uh, are, they fall into this particular category. Uh, I have no personal experience with Cahox uh, dual blades. So I'll be talking about the trabectome and also the gonio assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. So the trabectome basically, it is a special probe here and uh, which has a specialized tip which generates, you know, uses high frequency uh, current to generate plasma at the tip. And uh, with this, you can ablate the trabecular tissue. The, the probe is designed in a way that this tip goes into the Schlems canal, uh, you know, and uh, you can ablate the trabecular meshwork so that the inner chamber uh, connects easily with the uh, Schlems canal and through echospasis. So basically you need to have a direct gonioscope to position the patient, uh, you know, conveniently. So you have to tilt your microscope and this is one jack of lens I'm using. So you have to make a small incision in the clear cornea, uh, use a carrot arm to make, you know, 1.2 millimeter incision and through which you can use the the trabectome uh, tip, which is, as I said earlier, has an angled, uh, you know, pointed tip, which will, which can engage into the trabecular meshwork, into the stremis canal. And once that happens, you activate the probe and you sweep it across the angle in one direction. And then you can turn the probe and do in the opposite direction. And also you can change the mirror of the position a little bit uh, so by manipulating, turning the globe, uh, rotating the globe a little bit, you can do about 210 uh, degrees uh, ablation. And uh, mostly surgeons combine it with the uh, FACO surgery. So if that is the case, you can go ahead and do FACO multiplication and put an intraocular lens implant. However, you could do this procedure even without, uh, uh, you know, an intraocular lens implant. So that's uh, it. Basically, the procedure is quite simple and straightforward in that sense, but it needs uh, expertise with gonioscopy and also has a learning curve. And and of the surgery, you can just hide the pores, and uh, uh, that basically takes care. So trabectome, if you look at the outcome, uh, so now we have, we don't have a lot of literature, but still there's a good amount of data is now available. And this is from that trabectome study, uh, study group. So you can see that after about one year, it can still give you a good IOP control, almost 9.3 millimeters IOP lowering from the baseline. And when combined with the, you know, the comma sur uh, cataract surgery, still it has a good, uh, you know, IOP lowering in POAG as well as you exploration in glaucoma patients. Uh, so, and you, you can see this has been tried uh, in, in, you know, if you look at the larger series, larger databases, basically, uh, which uh, we have collected now. So in this particular, you know, publication, they looked at the, its efficacy uh, in reducing IOP in mild glaucoma or in moderate glaucoma. And it looks like that in, is you know, effect in both of these situations. Uh, however, it's a little more, uh, 
effective if the glaucoma is mild and a little less as compared to the, in the moderate or severe disease. And uh, the procedure has been tried in many different phenotypes of glaucoma, primarily open, uh, pseudo exposition, UVI to steroid induced pigmentary and TG juvenile, and it seems to work in most of these situations. The other procedure we're going to talk about is the GAD as gonio assisted translimino trabeculotomy. So, this can be done through an illuminated catheter or a 5 0 proline suture. The illuminated catheter is specially designed and it can push, push through the slums canal, events and no. And because it has an illuminated tip, so you can follow it through and you know where the you know, probe is going. However, this is quite expensive and uh, 5 with 0 proline suture is very inexpensive and a much cheaper alternative to, uh, you know, to this procedure. So using a 5 0 proline suture, you cauterize the end a little bit to make it bulbous and round. And uh, once that is done, you actually create a two port incision, one, you know, the main port, which is again, you can use an MVR knife. You don't need a big incision. You just MVR knife uh, incision about one millimeter is enough. And also inject some pilocarpine to constrict the pupil. And uh, then you can inject a viscoelastic uh, to maintain the anterior chamber. And then you made another port about 90 degrees away using the NVR knife again. And uh, meet the, the proline suture through the second you know, port inside. Then with the gonioscopy, you inspect the angle and uh, with the NVR knife, you create a little uh, opening a little nick into the Schlems canal just to you know give a starting point. And uh, once your trabecular meshwork is uh, incised, uh, you can enter the Schlems canal through that point. And then using some you know intraocular forceps, uh, you catch hold of that thread, that proline suture, uh, and uh, thread it through uh, the Schlems can canal. So we keep doing it. Uh, till it you know, up, reappears at the uh, point where trabecular meshwork was uh, incised. And uh, once that happens, we grab it, then we let, we'll grab that, uh, that end. So we are waiting for it to come and once it has come there, so now we grab that end and now we can remove the gonio prism and pull the other end. Uh, this is going to rip the trabecular meshwork 360 degrees and connect uh, the anterior chamber directly with the Schlems canal, canal. And then you can inspect, uh, uh, you know, usually the hyphema would happen in this position we haven't noticed so far. And after that, you remove the viscoelastic and just hydrate the pores and your procedure is uh, basically done. So there are not many studies, good studies basically, but I looked at this meta-analysis published recently in the International Journal of Thermology. They looked at 108 publications and found that 10 publications were good enough. They qualified the criteria to be included. And when they looked at the mean pool IOP reduction, it gave about 9.8 millimeter IOP reduction uh, combined for all these studies. Uh, and uh, also the pool surgical success rate, success rate that is uh, IOP of less, uh, IOP uh, reduction of more than 20% or IO, and IOP less than 21 millimeters of mercury with or without drugs. So pool success rate is, you know, over 80%, uh, 85%. And the combined for this data, the resurgery rates were 25%. So it's pretty good results actually. And there was a significant uh, uh, amount in the uh, reduction uh, of the eye drops was also number of eye drops used post-operative with control IOP was also seen. So these results uh, seems to be encouraging for at least uh, on a short to medium term follow-up. The usual complication most frequently seen is hyphema, which could see seen about in the pooled data, it was around 36%, uh, but somewhere around, you know, in it's like 20, 30 percent. Most of the studies you will see hyphema, which is not of much consequence. It goes away on its own, and you don't really need any intervention. Uh, some people may experience IOP spike, uh, and that needs to be taken care of. So we we we, we have to watch for the IOP spike in the post-operative period, and 
control it uh, with antiquilar form of drugs if that happens. So apart from that, other studies are actually, uh, other complications are very uh, negligible. They're low rate of complications. So GAT has been tried in different uh, phenotypes, again, pseudo exfoliation, pigmentary, UVIT, steroids, and it seems to work in most of the procedures. And as per you know, these authors, the GAT procedure is a safe and successful option for the treatment of moderate to advanced open angle glaucoma. Surgical success could be maintained up to about 18 months in their uh, experience. So to summarize, angle surgery for glaucoma is going to stay. Uh, a significant lowering of IOP uh, has been reported in, you know, uh, with this procedure in diff many uh, different phenotypes of glaucoma. Uh, is good, uh, has a good safety profile and generally done with cataract surgery where, where it forms a good uh, angle to cataract surgery. And thank you again uh, so much for uh, including me into this program, uh, AIUS and the General Ophthalmology Society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Pandav. I think uh, very nice and clear presentation on uh, GAD and uh, the trabectoma. I think many of these things have just come into India. I think uh, probably you could have the discussion uh, maybe after all the talks are completed. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. This is my talk on uh... Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm going to speak on an, on an update on a recent technique which we have been doing in our practices. And uh, uh, this is on uh, laser cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, using the micropulse laser. Intractable glaucomas in the past have been difficult to handle and uh, the glaucoma and FAKR, trauma, new vascularization, uh, penetrating uh, keratoplasty, post-PK and uh, eyes with poor vision and painful blindness. All of these procedures we were doing in this intractable, hard to treat glaucomas. We were doing cryotherapy in the past. We were doing diatomy in the past and then uh, we moved on to the diode laser, the continuous wave diode laser. For quite some time, we've been using the diode laser. And now as a recent addition to our armamentarium, we have the micropulse uh, diode laser. This is the older one called the G-probe. I think you're all familiar with the G-probe. It used to be placed uh, at the side view or the uh, probe is visible there in the picture. It's called the G-probe. It used to be placed in multiple spots in a circumferential manner around the eye. And the complications with the continuous diode laser used to be conjunctival burns and iridocyclitis, post-operative pain, hyphema vitreous hemorrhage, okay, hypotony, choroidal, and used to have quite a few complications and very rarely when a sympathetic ophthalmia has been reported. The new micropulse actually has uh, made uh, life easier for all of us. And uh, this uses micropulse technology to denature tissue while minimizing collateral damage and applies a series of short repetitive uh, bursts of energy and a sweeping moment, unlike a spot moment. The probe shape and contour is different. The uh, moment is a sweeping moment, unlike the uh, single application of the uh, spots. The duty cycle is 31.3% with an on time of 0.5 milliseconds off of 1.1. And it is applied in each hemisphere for 80 seconds in an, with an energy of 2000 milliwatts. And I usually do it in the operation theater setting because we are administering a peribulbar or a retrobulbar block. So these are the machine uh, console settings of 80 seconds and 2000. And uh, some case examples of where I have done this, uh, advanced primary angle closure glaucoma and the patient was refusing surgery. And we dread the complications of advanced angle closure glaucomas in which you dread shallow ACs and other complications. This patient agreed to undergo this procedure and has done extremely well after the micropulse uh, cyclophotocoagulation. This is a patient with good vision. Similarly, a patient with very poor compliance and intolerant, intolerant to all medications which you can think of prostaglandin, prinzolamide, and uh, even the other drugs which you bring on it in. So therefore, the patient has offered the laser photocoagulation and uh, the cyclophotocoagulation. She has also done extremely well after this, and now she applies only one medication. You can note the periocular pigmentation and the hyperemia in the eye. This is yet another patient with uh, advanced glaucoma, had a phaco trap first, didn't, uh, we, wasn't enough. Then we added a tube that also didn't control the pressure. Patient has started to have raised pressure and deteriorating loss. And therefore, we decided to do about 180 to 200 degrees of this particular micropulse CPC. And finally, he settled on the pressures now under control with one medication. 
so another uh, patient who had a uh, boston care capro in both eyes and uh, this patient also seemed to be deteriorating because we could not measure the intraocular pressure adequately the disc seemed to be getting progressively cupped so we decided to do the uh, micropulse cpc in this patient as well we did one eye first and then the other eye and then patient seemed to stabilize and hold on the pressure seemed to get control with the micropulse the continuous wave is definitely destructive and these are pictures from paul chu's uh, uh, publications in which they Uh, obvious damage and characteristic uh, destruction or cyclo destruction is seen tissue retraction and shrinkage whereas the micropulse does not show any evidence of clinically detectable tissue damage and it seems to be a much better alternative there are a few problems with cost and logistics in the indian scenario we do get a few iridocyclitis some patients experience a vision loss of one or two lines the pupil sometimes remains dilated and but the serious complications like choroidals and hypotonia i have not seen we do have an indian publication in which we have found one hypotony in the last 2 and 1/2 years in about 80 odd eyes so we are generally try to avoid it, uh, treating thin areas blood clots and recent post ops and inflammation we do, should not do this procedure many many publications in the recent journals the academy's journal the journal of glaucoma and many many other journals and uh, data shows that the iop lowering is quite good and we probably get about 25 to 35% iop reduction and definite reduction in the number of medications needed This is our own experience, which has been published in Springer's uh, International Ophthalmology recently. An initial Indian experience of about 55 eyes, and a very encouraging results with very very few complications, serious complications. It is said to act like pilocarpine, in which the uh, drug induces uh, ciliary muscle shortening, a scleral uh, fur rotation, PM movement, and uh, Schlem's canal changes, and therefore the vitreous scleral outflow increases through the extracellular matrix V modeling. So most probably it's said to work somewhat like pilocarpine. So this is a video of how uh, it is done. A sweeping movement. This is with the speculum on, and as you can see, the sweep movement uh, proceeds uh, for about 15 seconds. About five sweeps in one hemisphere below, and five sweeps uh, superiorly as well. And uh, this is a, in many patients we find people have been using drugs for a long time. The eyelids are tight. You're not able to apply a speculum. so this is one technique which i have learned to do without a speculum you can actually learn to use the uh, cotton tip applicator spread the eyelid apart and then use the probe itself to keep the eyelid away and uh, this is another method of doing the uh, cyclophotocoagulation so take home message from my talk today is very brief the, the micropulse cyclophotocoagulation cyclodestruction is an effective and a safe alternative to the continuous wave cpc which we used in the past can be used even in early and moderate glaucoma and not just intractable glaucoma patients with fair to good vision have been done in our study series itself definitely reduces the need for medication with fewer complications should avoid in eyes with recent surgery and inflammation but we definitely need longer term studies and follow up to look at the worrying aspect of vision loss and other complications which can happen long term studies definitely needed and uh, we need to wait to see what are the long term outcome of these patients and how many of them need retreatment How long does the IOP uh, lowering last in these patients? Thank you all. My sincere thanks to the German Ophthalmic Association for having me here and uh, letting me talk on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor Murli. I think that was a good uh, presentation uh, with the micro pulse uh, and. Uh, Uh, i did we don't have much experience in india i think you are probably the first one you know who had uh, you know collected that uh, that much data experience so do, do you have are you particularly worried about any complications uh, uh, i worry about the vision loss in uh, patients with 6966 vision so we keep them informed and if there's any concern i we simply tell them we don't want to do it we offer them a surgical alternative but when they don't want so uh, incisional surgery and you find a suppose pk glaucoma with fair vision very advanced angle closure glaucoma post trab and so on when you're sure the trab is not going to retrab is not going to work then we offer that and actually we have had quite good results now we have a series of about 75 to 76 eyes post angle closure glaucoma and having vision between 618 and 636 and uh, about 5% of them lost one line vision But I think otherwise we had no serious issues, so we're a little more confident and we become bold now. Would, would there be any situations, any cases where you would not like to use it in particular? I mean, my concern is because it kind of acts on the ciliary body. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Acts the ciliary uh, body repeatedly when you are applying it. 
and if you have a patient who is prone to retinal detachment or correct some, that's uh, true uh, maybe uh, even uh, high myopes with some yeah, uh, yeah would you be cautious in doing definitely that? sir i think it's better to be err on the side of caution than to do it recklessly for everyone you would definitely not do it in high myopes and with the history of detachment or some retinal breaks or you find some lattice or something of the how should test before treated in the past i would not take that up thin scleras ectatic areas and new vascular glaucomas in pediatric glaucomas we do it with a lot of caution and also very uh, thin scleras with people with aromat aromatic diseases and rheumatological problems where you expect thin scleras is going to be there inflammation inflammatory eyes definitely no fast inflammation also means that there could be a fibrin layer on the ciliary body and a scar or fibrin could be there which probably will reduce the effect of the uh, laser itself i think we definitely have to proceed with caution and each subgroup has to be treated on its merits okay. great <clears throat> yes please I, i have a question a uh, very nice uh, uh, presentation dr ariga um uh, am i understood when i'm when i talk yes. is yes. very very right. clear sorry very no, clear. i just you know i'm is we are yeah. a little far away in germany you so know, you I, don't I, sound I like you're speaking in any other language other than english <laughs> all right now i was wondering uh one trick you you just shown in your video is that you press away the the conjunctival redness right yes, you just compress right. because that's i right. i assume when you do you don't do that that the energy is then picked up by the blood vessels and you have uh, that's right. probably effects you don't want to so well, very nice to watch that um i was wondering this new technique does it create any what we used to call in the old days the pop effects when you have no, like no you don't get a pop with this you, you don't. don't get a pop with this a pop is definitely a micro explosion and you don't get a pop with this if you happen mm -hmm. to have a pop i think you better take your hands off and stop treating that patient no All pops right. in this with this you should not get pops all right that was very clear thank you so thank you sir you are just energy is the same standard energy for everybody or you Uh, i have actually varied only the duration of application i sometimes do it in quadrants now two quadrants three quadrants i leave areas which are already treated thin areas where there's a tube in place and so on uh, i don't change the energy but i have been changing the duration you can probably scale down the duration but i have not changed the energy okay great okay great. thank okay. you okay so who goes next uh... well i we 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 haven't made up our minds yet so i, I first of all i'm glad that professor prokhorov vilik from from cologne germany is yes. with us and I, i i see her and so i'm glad to see you yes <laughs> Because, me too <laughs> uh, so we we had a, oh. we had some problems with the firewall getting through but anyway i i suggest uh, if i may then i start my talk and we go first we, i go first and then as as scheduled yeah. with uh, professor prokosh vilik because i yeah. think i'm talking about a technique uh, which is older and she's talking about technique which is younger so it's <laughs> the same for the faces so um <laughs> I think um I I would like to share with you uh, my talk about the canaloplasty and I need to ask my coworker he's sitting next to me doing the technical stuff so I'm 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 just a surgeon and director so he's helping me out without uh, he's helping out with the with the screen sharing I hope you see that now yes <clears throat> okay good. so now I'm intrigued and and I was delighted to get Uh, an invitation to this precious meeting of yours and and uh, the german ophthalmological society and the all india society are, are working together and uh, the the first slide is a picture as you know for, of albrecht von greffe and and also of our logo and it was in fact albrecht von greffe who in, initiated our our society in 1857 So it is fairly old and we still doing we're still going going strong and I, and I'm absolutely honored and proud to be president for a year of that of that society. Now before I start my talk I would like to uh highlight one date also for you because the program of our yearly conference in September October will be held also in English so every day you have a string of English talks you can attend if you want to and uh, just google our homepage and you just get get through to the program and to the conference if you want to but you know i'm not i'm not here i'm not not sitting here talking about our next conference because it's yours and i would like to share some data and some techniques with you uh in the glaucoma surgical field which is canaloplasty um and this is the topic of my talk would like to share with you some experience with the microcatheter 
uh, Alex Cathedral of external canal plastic adults and children. Now, as you know, the the technique uh, was developed by Stigman. So these, this is the overview. I just have three topics, long-term results and adults and, and what I do with the catheter with my group in, in childhood glaucoma, uh, severe childhood glaucoma. So as you know, uh, Stegman in South, South Africa developed the technique because he was fed up doing traps and, and colored people and, 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 and blacks. So he, 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 he thought about a technique that gets away from the blab towards the inner Schlem canal collector channels to open them up. Uh, so he, he's, it's quite similar to viscocanalostomy and he, he developed that technique in 2005. And the, the name below Stegmann is Professor Kerber who introduced the same technique in 2005 in, in Cologne actually, uh, where Pro, for Professor Prokoshvili she is sitting right now. And as he was a close friend of Ker, of Stegman, uh, uh, he let him have the technique straight away. So he started in 2005. And the data I'm going to present are his data. They're not my data. I just uh, followed them up and worked them through. So he did the surgery. I'm not the one who did the surgery. So I must be clear about that. So we have data where fairly old from canaloplasty from 2005 to 2007 that I'm going to present. Uh, it is an illuminated microcatheter that had lots of advantages, as you know, and the, the final goal of the surgery is to, to, uh, to situate a proline 10 zeros proline suture and Schlem, Schlem's canal to uh, dilate and keep the Schlem canal uh, uh, open. Now, you also have a um, heal on GV to dilate a uh, Schlem canal and collector channel. Uh, but I personally think the primary goal is to place the suture and hold the attention. And I'm going to show you a brief video how to, how to exactly do this. Um, I hope it's running now. I'm, I, we just take a minute to watch this. Uh, the suture is already placed inside Schlem's canal all the way around. It, you see it's very tiny. You have the, the, the lower flap, it's been cut away. And you have, uh, you have to suture that four times. You have to sling this, the, the suture around each other four times so it doesn't uh, flush open, get, get, be open again once the tension is, is released. Now, what I'm doing now is I pre-lay the suture on the decimens windows. And uh, this is the essential trick that you're going to see now is that you have to put down the pressure of the eye to zero. So you have, the, you have an hypotony. Once the hypotony is achieved, then you can place the suture tension. Many people don't do that. And then this canaloplasty just fails. Here, you can see the tension. Okay. You can actually see how Decimens window is pulled in. And the result of this is that you have, once the, the, the pressure is going up again to normal rates or to, to the pressure you want to achieve, that the tension is increased in the suture and it dilates Schlem's canal to the maximum. And this is what you need. You can see that actually in the next slide where you can see the pre-surgery OCT compared to the post-surgery OCT on top, I can actually see a slit open and the Schlem canal is dilated. This is done by the suture. It's not done by the proline or the helon injection, all right? The helon injection just gets to the collector channels and disappears fairly quickly. But this suture is held for many, many, many years. You can see it in gonioscopic view, as seen here in, in the chamber angle. Uh, and you can actually do something with it once canaloplastic fail, which it doesn't very often. So this is very briefly the uh, retrospective study design. It hasn't been published yet because it's been part of an habilitation, which in Germany is, is a pre pre prohibited to be published. But it, we are going to do that in the future, in the next, in the, in the future to, to soon to come. So these are the canaloplastic plasties I mentioned, the years, and we have uh, the exclusion criteria or previous surgery, apart from normal FACO and normal EVOM, um, uh, the intravitreal injections and the success successes here that defined as below 18, as you know, and, and uh, definition one, definition two, without and with drops as complete uh, 
or partial success respectively. And this is the overall rule. There were about 70, more than almost 80 patients involved. And you can see over the years, over 10 years follow up, that the procedure is actually working very nicely long term, very nice. You can see the patients' numbers drop because uh, some of them are lost follow up, of course, over the lo long time period. Some of them died. Uh, so this, these are the basic data, and you can see the pressure is, all, uh, is fairly low with a few drops, which is uh, not the total uh, success, of course. These are the Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, evaluations of the four uh, different uh, uh, survival functions and uh, uh, cumulative survival rates, uh, and you can see 125 months is quite a long time for, for a study. And you can see that the the, the, the technique works fairly, fairly good. These are the pressures over the years, 11 in total, and it's, it's bringing the pressure down fairly nicely. We had a very few complications, not we, Professor Kerber had few complications, high femur, corneal edema, iris adhesions, very little complications. Now, uh, this is a video of something that, uh, prof, uh, that Dr. Uh, Pandav already showed, uh, this is pulling the suture after failure of canaloplasty when the pressure goes up again. You can do, by pulling this, a 360-degree trabeculotomy, which works very nicely as an exit strategy. We, I can conclude, before I talk about the children, I can conclude from these long-term data that canaloplasty is safe and effective, that the partial, and partial success, success rates over the years is very high and the complete success as well. And it, as you've seen, it's, it requires skillful microsurgery, but it's rewarded by good results. Now for the um, children and congenital glaucoma cases, uh, these are just briefly the time frame I just uh, uh, looked at. It's five years in, in the past, and in Germany, it's not it's not a very a frequent operation or um, illness that is that we are presented with very often because it's very rare. As you know, uh, this is what we found: Axenfeld, Riga, Stolzweber. Uh, and, and there's quite a, dis a difference between the ages and, and the ages of the patients. And 12 of these received 360 degree trabeculotomy. What is that? Now, this is actually a technique that uses the catheter um, all the way around. I always use very, very much like the external approach because I don't want to create cataract, especially not in children, especially not in those children. And the, the yellow color, you're going to explain later. But once the once the suture is going, once the catheter is going all the way around, you actually just pull both ends and use the catheter as a cheese wire to open up um, the meshwork. Here you go, and you just pull out and close the wound without a blab, and you can already see the anterior chamber bleeding present. These are the data, so the, the children worked out very nicely. None of them had hypotony of thesis bulby, all worked fine. And uh, when, you you, when you make one of these children happy, you make at least two parents happy as well. And I mustn't tell you that. Now, this is canalography, which I always perform when I have a little child have, receiving this procedure. Look at, the, at this area here. You can see the bleaching first, because, and then once the fluorescein is injected into Schlem's canal, you can actually see how it works out and fills collector channels and later the upper and lower conjunctiva and tenon vessels. Um, this gives me a good hint whether, canal, uh, um, whether a 360 de degree trabeculotomy will work in children because once this is present in a child, usually the pressure goes down very nicely. If it is not present, uh, usually the children go for Ahmed or Bavard implantation. So it gives us a clue how the um, exit of aqueous humor out of these children's eyes is actually done and anatomically uh, present or not. So I always perform 
canalography in childhood glaucoma. So in conclusion, I'm at the end of my talk in 10 minutes. Uh, canaloplasty is not a fast procedure, but has very good long-term results in adults, is bleb free which I like. Uh, Professor Pfeiffer will talk about the blabs, and I love blabs as well when I need them. And uh, But it is bleb free leaves the aqueous where it should be and should drain and opens vast diagnostic options for childhood glaucoma cases. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor James. And that was a great uh, presentation. I think uh, uh, we have been hearing about these uh, kind of plastic procedures, but uh, um, never got to do ourselves, uh, at least uh, I haven't done it, but it looks very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering, I mean, it must be a little hard to really adjust the, how tight uh, you, know, you, you keep the suture. Um, I, I would be worried, you know, that it will, it will cut through the, you know, the mm -hmm. meshwork and come in the anterior chamber if you make it a little too mm -hmm. tight. Mm -hmm. Especially, I was, mm -hmm. especially when the, the pressure builds up and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, it's going to little expand a little bit and uh, it's going to cut through. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that happen? Uh, now, I am using this technique since 2007, and I've never seen uh, a wire or a proline suture coming into the interior chamber uh, after I've closed up everything. I've seen it, seen it a couple of times when I, I put too much tension on the, on the suture right away, but not after post-operatively if you've never seen it. It's surprising how much resistance the trabecular meshwork really has. It is quite surprising. And even the HARMS probe I'm using, uh, or I have used in children, it's sometimes quite a lot of force needed in order to swing the probe into the anterior chamber. Uh, so th the tissue is very tough um, compared to what it does and how, how flimsy it really looks like. Well, that's a point, I've, but I've never seen any, 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 any of that post-op uh, If uh, it happens, uh, you know, do you convert into a you know, that we call lotomy, uh, like 360 degrees, you pull out the suture, you just leave it the way, like. Well, then I, I, then I just leave it and, and, clo and close up. And if, 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 if the pressure goes up, I mean, trabegalotomy in, in adults never really worked very well. Well, at least not in Europe or in this country. <laughs> but uh, when, when the pressure goes up, um, I do tra trabecalectomy. And when you watch these videos again, you, you can see that I never do canaloplasty in the 12 o'clock position. That's forbidden, verboten, uh, because this is the area you need for trabecolectomy. So I always go to the one or 11 o'clock position. Sometimes I'll go temporal for canaloplasty, which, is, which you can do because you don't have a blab at all after the surgery. So it's nothing disturbing for the conjunctiva, but the... The 12 o'clock position needs to be free and unscarred for later procedures like trabecolectomy. Thanks, I think that's a good tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Doctor, any other questions? If you have no questions, then we'll go to the next lecture. Yeah, yeah okay, so. Did it correctly? Yes, I do. It's all fine. Um, hello, everybody. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, uh, not yet. Yes, ma'am. No. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. But, yes, yes. But, but late. I have to. I have to wind back now. So, um, hello, everybody, and um, thanks a lot for the invite. It's um, a great pleasure to me to speak at this, this huge conference in India. And um, Professor Thieme has mentioned already our conference in Germany. So, um, and we'd, we'd, we'd be very happy to have some of you joining it there. Um, I will talk about a more uh, recent method, let's say, or concept, which is called mix. And I was asked to talk about the crucial question, whether mix can stand the test of time. And um, I invite all of you to go through it with me together. So we all know, um, this is just an introduction, that IOP lowering is the only evidence-based treatment 
to hold glaucoma because this big elephant is jumping on the lamina cribosa. And we all know that the only evidence-based treatment is to get this pressure down, to get the elephant jumping not on the lamina cribosa, but maybe somewhere else or not jumping at all, let's say. And we all know that the big studies have shown that the pressure reduction reduces the pressure. But the crucial question is, how can we achieve it? And of course, we all know that we all most of us start with drops or maybe SLT, and we start with one drops like here in 2016, then we see progression, nasal cupping. Um, so we introduce a second drop and we see more progression and we use the third drop, but the patient still progresses. So I think that's the dilemma we always have in clinics everywhere in the world, in India, in Germany, wherever. And the question is, how can we solve that problem, especially if the patient says, I can't remember if I forgot to take my eye drops last night. So it's not only about the effectiveness of the drops, it's about the adherence of the patient, which might be weak. And sorry, and, and if we talk about this, I, um, I will just show you, this was the, the slide that the trabeculectomy has stood the, uh, the, the time um, because it celebrated its 50th birthday some years ago, basically. And it's still available in the 21st centuries. There have been big uh, multi-center trials and analyzers um, testing the effect of it. And it's still, let's say, the gold standard for glaucoma surgery. It's been enhanced by the use of antimetabolites. It's reducible and synthesizable. It's cost-effective. And um, like, for example, the, this, this study has showed that um, almost 80% achieved a target IOP below 18 and 20% reduction of the pre-op IOP without drops. So we know one thing for sure, I don't have to tell you, that trabeculectomy did stand the test of time. But what about the complications? There are some complications. There might be encapsulation of the black, which needs revision, black leaks, a shallow IC, cord attachment. Every glaucoma surgeon has gone through all those complications. And that's sometimes not easy to deal with the patients and to, to, to handle the patients and to, to revise those complications. Although they are not, not very, very common, they're still difficult to deal with and uh, difficult for the patient. So the new era might be minimal invasive glaucoma surgery. What does it mean? It means that, um, um, that there's minimal tissue destruction, there's a short surgical time, simple instrumentation and fast post recovery. The definition changes a bit on whether you are in the States or whether you're somewhere else, whether it's like a clear cornea cutting and not non-touching of the conjunctiva. And recently this term has moved a bit to being differentiated between mix, which is minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And on the other hand, there's LICS, less invasive glaucoma surgery, which might include touching the conch. And I'll explain it now. Well, what methods with this minimally invasive surgery do we have? There are three different solutions at the moment. Increasing the trabecular outflow as a natural flow with the eye stand, the eye stand inject, the eye stand W. You can see already this device has changed over time slightly. The Hydrus, which has been newly launched now in Germany two months ago, the Trabectome and the Kahook Dual Blade. There might be increasing the outflows for the supracordial space by means of pass, side pass, which has been taken off the markers, or the eye star, which is kind of similar, or creating a subconjunctival space of outflow. So the first one will be increasing the trabecular outflow. And I go through it with you. What do we have? Well, actually, there's loads on the market. Uh, first of all, there's the Hydrus micro stand, which you can see in the upper bit here, which is meant to be restorative, you could say. There's the I stand. Nowadays, it's the I stand W. There's the, um, um, the up internal canaloplasty by dilating the canal and there are more disruptive procedures, you could argue, with the trabectome or the Kahook dual blade. So the eye stand G, I'm just gonna show you some pictures, is the smallest implant we have on the market. Um, and it was launched as the, the eye stand, which you can see in, on the upper right. And um, then it's been modified to the eye stand inject 
because it uh, seemed more likely that the pressure would be lowered better if there would be two sides where the stent could be placed as the Schlems canal is not like a tube, it's got, um, it's got little folds and it's got little, little walls and everything in it. So it's more likely to reduce the pressure if you put more than one. So the eye stand inject and nowadays the eye stand W. The hydrus microstand is the largest of all the implants, you could argue. Um, it's, uh, it um, infaces the Schlems canal by 90 degrees and dilates it and is meant to restore it. Um, so um, it's eight millimeters in length and it's um, quite of nickel. So here's a video of how you implant it actually. You've, you see this injector, you find the trabecular meshwork and then you just roll it forward and you can see the uh, hydrus nicely placed in this Schlems canal. Uh, sometimes you just have to adjust it slightly if it's not well positioned by pushing it a bit forward, but once you are in, you are in and you can see all the three windows here shown nicely shining through the tabecular meshwork. This is a perfect position of the hydrus. So the next one would be, apart from those, increasing the outflow through supercolon space. We've heard uh, before about the Kahook and the tropic tone, um, which would be meant by the side pass or the mini inject. So this is the mini jet and the side pass. They both are meant to enter the supercoidal space and increase the outflow via the supercoidal space. This is a video of the, of the uh, just show it for proof of concept of the side pass. I don't have any video of the um, mini jet. So you do the same. You've got this gonioscopic view. Um, you um, do a small clear corneal cut. You, um, you enrich the anterior chamber with some helon. Then you plant the device. You look for that space. This is the implant. You have to, you have to, you have to look a bit to be in the correct position to enter the supercoidal space. That's, that's for sure the most difficult bit of it. But once you are in, you are in and you can move it forward quite easily. You can say here, position found underneath the trabecular meshwork, which is here quite nicely um, visualized and you just push it forward. And the same happens with the eye stand inject. That's the other concept. The third one is creating a subconjunctival space nowadays named as LIX rather than MIX, maybe as less invasive because you still touch a conch, you have better IOP lowering effect with um, more complications. And you can see here the Xen stand and the pressure flow, which I haven't shown here, is a similar device, but you have to open the conch completely. Even the Xen has, has been launched as a 45 um, one, but now the 63 is available, having the advantage that the lumen, as you can see here, is 63 micrometer, is slightly bigger, so having a better flow. And the injector has changed a bit as well, so it can fill the whole incision site. So you don't get um, early onset hypotony, which happened before with it then, um, because the injection site is larger than the filling of the stent. This would actually close down after a couple of days, but not initially. So here's a video of the Xen stent implantation. You have you do a small paracentesis as well. I'm going to just move a bit forward. You inject a bit of helon. This is the um, injector. You go all the way to the other side. You can do it with gonioscope view, or you, you can't. You, you make sure that the iris doesn't move. You saw like the iris moved a bit. So you were a bit too, um, not, not in the right position. And you just push it in. You see the, the small tip coming out. And then you push, push the Xen stand in underneath the conch. And you retract the injector. You just retract it. Ideally, you can only see it, you can hard, hardly see it, and you've got um, Zen underneath the conch. You make sure that, um, that um, it's free and there's no pigtail um, later on. Just make sure it's, it's freed up. 
and you don't have any pigtails. You can see it's here slightly underneath the bleeding. Um, that's the stent, and you put, um, just wash the helon out again. So actually, where are we? Like, what are our options? Uh, actually, if you if you think about it, in glaucoma, we've got so many options. Maybe as many options as as no other eye specialty has already. So you start with medication and the SAT later. Then you have got the trabecular meshwork stents, let's call it ice and hydrus, and then you have got the um, Lix, the Xen, or the uh, pressure flow stents. You've got deep sclerectomy. We've heard about it, and canaloplasty as non-penetrating glaucoma surgery is very nice. And last but not least, the traps and the tube shunts. So um, and the risk increases if you go here to, to the right side and the IOP lowering increases as well. So the, the better the IOP lowering effect actually is, um, the higher is the risk. But the crucial question, will it stand the test of time? Well, what are the characteristics we need? Well, it should still be present. There should be an IOP lowering effect over time. There is a good risk profile, a good quality of life effect, and there's a cost effectiveness to last over the years, like the trabeculectomy did. So first question, is it still present? Well, actually, it changed, if we think about it. So the device has changed, like um, the eye stand has been changed twice already. The Zen is about to change completely. Let's see what the comparison studies say about the Zen 45 and the Zen 60C. And the Cypass has been taken off the market. So actually, you can see that it's changed a bit and they are making better and better probably. What about the IOP lowering effect over time? Well, what does mean over time? If you think about our patients, of course, it depends on how young and old the patient is. A 40 year old, it should last for years. And um, the, um, the eye stand, what is known about the eye stand for sure? There's not too much, but uh, there's a good Cochrane review, and it says that it's uncertain whether there was any difference in terms of mean reduction IOP from baseline. Um, the horizon trial shows good results for the, for the hydrus. The five years results show a good um, IOP lowering effect from baselines, although combined with FACO. They combined FACO versus FACO alone, and uh, combined with FACO, it had an, an, a lowering effect of minus seven micrometer over time. But the difference of the, of the hydrus alone only made two millimeters of mercury. So you get an additional effect to the hydrus, to the, to the FACO with, with a hydrus of two millimeters of mercury. But um, the, the Cochrane database review says that there is um, mild to moderate open angular coma. There's moderate certainly evidence combined with cataract surgery that it um, increases um, and requires less lowering, IOP lowering medication. Cypress um, had a, an IOP reduction proven as well, but it was taken off the market, as we all say, because of the endothelial cell loss. And the four-year results of the Xen implant show, show good IOP lowering effect, um, although um, um, probably not as good as the uh, traps. So what do we know? Although MIX seem efficient in the reduction of IOP and glaucoma medication and show good safety prototype, this evidence is mainly derived from non-comparative study and further good qualities RCTs are warranted. So we still don't know. What about the risk profile? Well, the Cypass was taken off the market because of the endothelial cell loss. There has been accommodations for the care providers to not use it anymore. Um, compared to that, the Hydrus, of course, the company made sure that there's no endothelial cell loss over five years. There is none. As you can see here, it didn't change much. And the complications with the trabecular stent, at least, they are foreseeable and they are quite mild to moderate, no, no severe complications. It looks a bit different, although having the better OP lowering defect that, for example, in Zen and even in pressure flow, the, detation, the, the complications um, increase actually. There have been supercurrent hemorrhages described and corneal attachment and shallow SCs. Quality of life effect is the next one. What do we know? Not too much, but there was no diff significant difference between traps and mix in the quality of life six months post-operatively, although IOP was significantly lower in the traps. But um, the, still, still more studies have to be seen. And I think that's quite crucial to find more studies. And the last one is the cost effectiveness. What do we know? Well, the systematic literature review of clinical and economic outcomes of microinvasive glaucoma surgery in primary open orbital coma shows 
there is limited available evidence on the cost effectiveness of mix. And therefore, it remains unclear whether the cost using mix is outright by cost savings to decreased medication and need for further interventions. So I think even this topic has to be um, looked into a bit deeper. Um, so to, to, to know whether um, maybe um, it will stand the test of time. And on the other hand, we don't oh, we not only have the traps we need to think about. We've got selective laser tuberculoplasty versus mix as well. So the question is, it has uh, SAT is a low complication procedure as well and effective method. So the question is whether mix provide any further evidence that it's even better as a choice for mild and moderate forms of glaucoma and accepted topical treatment. So finally, yes, they are still present. There's a moderate and IOP lowering effect over time, at least we've got the data from the hives of over five years. The risk profile, at least for the tubercular stents, are good. And there's a recommendation um, that it, it, it can be used together with, with the phaco modification in those patients. The quality of life effect, surprisingly, there's not much data and we don't know yet. And the cost effectiveness still needs to be seen as well. And I thank you for all the attention. Thank you, Professor Prakash. That was a very excellent presentation. I think uh, we went through the entire, you know, evidence that we have at this present, uh, you know, time, you know, regarding these uh, mix. Uh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I was just wondering, have you ever encountered, you know, the the dislodged uh, device? But they're very tiny devices, and what if they get dislodged from the tip? I mean, I've I've seen. I think the, the the ones you see most times dislodged are the eye stands because um, you you find them suddenly somewhere attached on the iris or not in the trabecular meshwork because they're so small they are really easy to dislodge. Um, I've seen some hydruses being dislodged as well. If they're not placed properly, then it's quite tricky because they then still might. So you need to make sure, especially with the hydrus, it's because it's such a long and big device that it's properly placed. The good thing about it is though, if you do it properly, then you, you can't really get, get wrong. If you're in the tropical meshwork, then it's fine. Um, the side pass, yes, um, after all this, these three rings came out, um, I haven't taken it out. I don't know where the other, other and maybe Hagen Thieme has done or Norbert Pfeiffer, like um, I, I just cut the rings to make it shorter. Uh, as that, that, that's what, what I did actually. And of course, even the Xens, um, they can dislodge a lot underneath the conch or even backwards into the AC. So there is the chance to dislodge for sure, which you need to um, uh, take into account as well. What do you do if, say, I stand gets dislodged? Uh, so you just leave it behind. It will be impossible to find it. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. just leave it there and, and yeah. put a new one or do some other procedure, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. So that's very interesting. I, I think uh, the, the, these mix are becoming more and more popular. And I think uh, they are presented so just suggest that we are going to, um, you know, they are going to be there around the corner. And things are only improving, I think. Uh, those uh, those of the procedure which are not working well or have complication, they will get phased out, you know, eventually like we already had with the Cypass. But I think others are going to be there. Thank you. Very much. As, as, yeah. as a matter of inter interest, uh, Mr. Pandav, uh, how is the situation in India? I mean, that's a big, a big question, a big country, but, but in general, the situation with mix in India, and also maybe the reimbursement issues because they are quite costly, aren't they? They're very expensive. I, I, I didn't think, I don't think uh, any glaucoma surgeons are actually uh, had gone mm -hmm. on to this, uh, primarily because the cost is uh, high. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you look in terms of IUP control, the cost benefit ratio probably is still not favorable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most mm -hmm. population. Yeah, so I think most of the drug companies, device manufacturers, they are not actually marketing it in India as of now, because okay. uh, they don't have a you know good pricing policy uh, for us. Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah. Just to say hello, Norbert Pfeiffer, I was uh, able to join you. So if you take me last or so, then I can give my well, presentation. Professor Pfeiffer, we are ready to listen to you and welcome to <laughs> welcome to India. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to be there. Actually, uh, the, 
the day we started with the lockdown, uh, that was um, um, March the 13th, I was uh, heading out for India, which I then couldn't do because of the pandemic situation. So I'm longing to come some other time. Yeah. So, but if you just take me last, I, I, I just joined, so I don't know which talks have already been presented. You let me know when I should go. You have done most of the things, I think. Uh, uh, you are the only one now among us. <laughs> So, so I, it's your turn right away. <laughs> oh, it's my turn. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> so, all right. So then I should share my screen. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. And open. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Okay. And I hope this, no, this one is, I think, the right one. And then share the screen. And it may, right. Are you seeing the presenter mode or the other mode? We are not seeing your slides yet. You are not seeing my slides. That's bad. Okay, let me try again. Sir, okay. back side of your slide open. Technical support. Yes, sir. Back side of your slide open. Now in the Zoom, the sharing option. There must be, uh, sir, this is a hall coordinator. There must be an option for sh uh, share screen. Yes, I, I, uh, yes, I, I uh, use that option. Okay. So, what you have to do is that you open your PowerPoint on your desktop. I did that. Yeah. Open your PowerPoint or desktop. Yes. And that's open. And sharing. Option sharing. There's a green tab. Yeah, uh, green. Bottom of the screen. Click. Green tab. Yes. 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 And it and shows several the... screens. And uh, the um, presentation. Right. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes sir. Yes, yes, sir. Now it's visible. Great. Right. Okay. Now I go to presentation mode. And do you see the presentation mode or the presenter's view or the other view? Perfect. Presenter view, sir. Presenter's view. Perfect. Right. Then let's try uh, to change that. So yes. do you okay. see the... It's oh, that's okay. Yes, we can. Yes, Marvelous. Sir, perfect. So... Um, You've heard a lot about mix and other things. And I think we've just also heard that um, um, trabeculectomy is still a very good um, method. Uh, my task is to present you the long-term outcome of trabeculectomy. And when you talk about trabeculectomy, we must um, also define what we understand by trabeculectomy. So this is what it looks during the surgery. And um, I would like to show you 10 years results in a few minutes. And I'll also show you the, the, the method that we are using in Mainz, which is in Germany, close to Frankfurt. So before surgery, we stop any topical therapy for four weeks and use Diamox if necessary. And for the five days before surgery, we use steroids. This is to take away any inflammation from the eye. I always, if possible, use a phonics based incision, so I do the incision at the limbus. Now, when you do that, you must have a technique to render a watertight suture, a watertight wound closure, and I'll show you how in a minute. And I have been using mitomycin C in 100% of cases since it was available. But also frequently, I give additional 5-FU, so I'm playing hard. Now, the next uh, slide shows you how I do the technique. And uh, as I say, and, and this is an old film, and I do that on purpose because I show you the results of this very technique. So I do the incision at the limbus. I'm using a razor blade going both ways because it's important to cut both the conjunctiva and tenons capsule. Use very little cautery, insert a sponge with mitomycin C for at least two, but usually five minutes, 0.2 milligrams per ml then rinse. And now this is perhaps a little bit special. I cut a groove into the cornea from left to right, and this will be used to later on anchor the conjunctiva. Then the scleral flap is dissected. Uh, I usually, usually say in about half scleral thickness. Well, it's difficult to say what is half the scleral thickness, but it must be thick enough not to allow any holes to be created because then it's an unguarded fistulation and it can be very, very difficult to um, uh, manage that. 
So then I take that uh, preparation very far anteriorly because I don't want to do a trabeculectomy. I don't cut out the trabeculum. What I want to do is to do a clear cornectomy. Here's the trabecular meshwork. So this is the first incision far more anteriorly. And the, one, the second one is close to the trabecular meshwork. Um, so take out that. As a matter of fact, only in one third of cases I see trabecular meshwork in the specimen. Then I always do an iridectomy, um, close the scleral flap. And now the suture I think is important. I put the suture first in down at the bed of the scleral flap, then go through the scleral flap. When you do that, you'll bury the knot underneath the scleral flap. And it means it keeps it open a little bit. So there is fistulation. This is 10 O nylon. You can use anything else. I think it's good if it's not reactive. Then the second uh, knot is placed here, a third here, and usually a fourth one here. Those I do superficially, so I don't bury the knot because I want to be a little bit more, more watertight uh, anteriorly, and I want to be a little bit more open posteriorly. Now, I always check whether fistulation is actually as it should be. So I've done a stab incision and I'm looking for aqueous humor to come out here, which is the case. Now, I think it's very important to anchor the conjunctiva in a watertight fashion. Usually, and I've done that for many years, just do one stitch at the left side and one at the right side and keep it like that. And very often it is watertight after surgery but very often it's not watertight on the first uh, or the following post-operative days. So I go through the conjunctiva, through the groove, through uh, the cornea, then take it um, um, uh, uh, in the other way around, again, go through the, um, the cornea, through the groove, through the conjunctiva, catch the thread and do that several times. And when you then pull tight, the conjunctiva is pulled firmly into the groove and that gives it that extra stability that you need to have a watertight in uh, wound closure. And this is very important. Again, check for watertightness at the end of surgery. Now you see how the filtration plate is filling. So if you do that, um, chances are good. You can use five of you post-operatively and you don't uh, fiddle around with uh, Overfiltration. So the next slide then shows you the 10 year MINDS results of 316 uh, surgeries. And you see that the pressure initially was, was a mean of 30, but some very high pressures. On the first post operative day, it doesn't need to be very low, but then when patients go home, it should be about 11 or 12. And that is the case. And after three years, five years, seven years, and 10 years, it slowly goes up. It does that to a mean of 50 millimeters mercury. So these are the mean values. And the next slide shows you the proportion of patients reaching a certain result. So as you can see, about 60% after 10 years are below or at 50 millimeters mercury. About 80% have 18 and actually 21 is about the same, a little bit higher. So is that a good result? Yes or no? I think it's quite acceptable. And it's also an operation that is fairly straightforward and cheap. Now, however, one has to deal with complications. And one is intraocular pressure is too high. And the other one also is intraocular pressure is too low. Now, to be able to manage two high pressures, we have to be able to read the filtration blab. The next slide shows you a, a filtration blab on the first post-operative day. So there is a little bit of redness of the eye. That should go away quickly if there is enough aqueous humor uh, filtrating out of the eye. But a month later, it should look like that. You shouldn't see anything. You can just see the outline of the scleral flap. And here you see the continuous suture, interlocking suture that um, uh, I'm, I'm using. Now, this is fine, but if it's uh, like that, then ob obviously this is an encapsulated blab blowing up like, uh, well, with too much pressure. Now, a needling procedure is helpful. And I think we are all doing needling procedures, but sometimes we are not doing 
enough or we are not vigorously enough. So here's my suggestion. Use a relatively thick needle, puncture away from the filtration pleb, then puncture the pleb. So start a little bit laterally, puncture the pleb and do a vigorous opening of tenon's capsule that has formed. So go to one side and go to the other side, even with a little bit of needle bending. One has to open tenon's capsule uh, over a very large area in order to avoid that it is closing again quickly. What are the results of needling? Well, in my hands, uh, I started with about 40 needling, uh, uh, 40 patients that needed needling. And about two thirds were good after the first one, one was bad. I did not go on to surgery, to a trabeculectomy again, repeat trabeculectomy, but did a second needling procedure. And again, about half of them were controlled and the other one, other, other half needed needling. And I didn't even give up then, but did repeat needling. And again, about half are okay and half need a fourth needling and so on. And even the fifth needling can be successful. So my suggestion is do not give up, try to have success, try to enforce success, and it will help in the long run. So the other problem is too low pressures, and actually too low pressures are not so infrequent. You've seen a very nice filtration pleb. It looks ideal, but unfortunately, the pressure is only between two and four millimeters mercury. And also, unfortunately, this shows at the fundus of the eye, you see choroidal folds, the, the pressure goes down, but unfortunately visual acuity also goes down. Now with a filtration pleb like that, you are very hesitant to go back and do additional sutures to open up the conjunctiva because really the filtration pleb looks very nice. So I thought about what to do and I invented interlocking, I invented uh, sutures that go through, uh, the, uh, through the plant. And the next slide shows you just how to do that. So the aim is to preserve filtration, to have a very low risk procedure and to avoid a conjunctival incision. And here you see the eye and the filtration pleb. And what I do, I go through the filtration pleb, through the scleral flap, through the adjacent sclera, out again and then tie the knob. And this can be done in an, a topical anesthesia with tenor nylon sutures. And the, uh, uh, the next slide shows you how to do that. It's a short film and I push away the filtration blab so then I can see the outline of the scleral flap. Take a tenor needle, uh, have to, you have to hold it very steep, go through the edge of the scleral flap through the adjacent sclera and out through uh, the conjunctiva again. And of course you create two holes in the conjunctiva, but filtration is rarely a problem. But what you have to do is then put a very firm stitch over that. So I pull and pull and pull and nylon is soft. So you may have to release and push again and uh, pull again and then lock the suture in one or the other direction. So really bring down the sclera, the conjunctiva to the sclera. And depending on what the situation is, I put in between one and sometimes four, even five stitches uh, perpendicular here to the limbus or also the other way around. Now, it's difficult to say how high the pressure is going to be afterwards, but usually a few stitches are enough to bring up the pressure and fistulation is rare. Now the following slide shows you, shows you the results of this very eye. Um, here you see the pre-op uh, filtration blam. And on the following day, it looked like that with one, two, three stitches and one, one parallel to the limbus. This is what it looks like on the first post-operative day. One week later, you can't see even the stitches because they have melted through the conjunctiva. Sometimes if pressure is too high, I take them out. Sometimes I leave them. And three months later, you can't see the stitches because they have gone through the conjunctiva. What are the results? In a large series that we did, here you see the pressure before surgery, 
it was in the mean of four millimeters mercury, went up to 20 on the first post-operative day, and then down to 10 initially to a mean of nine. And visual acuity that was low first went up. This is LOGMA. So visual acuity can be restored for quite a while. So in summary, trabeculectomy can be very successful. Avoid fistulation by for example, using an interlocking suture. Try transconjunctival sutures via topony, hypotony, and always fight for success. Only give up, don't give up, just try to bring the pressure down. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Professor Pfeiffer. That was great. I think Tavitlekin still goes you know, doing wonders to a lot of people and a lot of patients. Uh, I think is just that we need to do it more meticulously, more carefully. And every time you see someone doing it, you will always learn a few things. That's amazing. The procedure has been there for such a long time and we, we continue to learn more and more about it. Uh, that's a wonderful talk. And especially those future applications for a uh, hypotony, I think that's just a great idea. Absolutely, fantastic. So, so there, I, I, to have that to have that around just helps you to be a little bit more bold with reaching for low pressures, because we need low pressures in most patients. It's sometimes even uh, single digit pressures, and then you are concerned to have too low pressures. But if you have that, you know it's not so difficult to mend that. Mm -hmm. So great and excellent talks. So, first of time, do you have any comments and? Uh, well, I, I don't have a lot of comments to, to what Norbert Pfeiffer was just telling because I'm actually, I, I learned how to do terbecalectomy in his clinic and uh, uh, I'm, I'm still very thankful for what I, you know, was able to learn with him at his side with him. Um, uh, I still do lots of terbecalectomy in the place I am now uh, and, and actually the technique is so refined that it does need doesn't need to be improved at all because it works. You know, you have always with this suture on the limbus, you have tight and very good wound closure. You don't have any fistulation and you don't have any fistulation by hypotony caused by aqueous humor gushing out toward the limbus, towards the cornea. This never exists. Um, and the technique with troubleshooting techniques it's are very refined. So it, in, in the proper hands, it's a very safe technique. And all the, the horror pictures we're just seeing uh, of blabs not working and scarring and not working properly are, are the ones that are presented to us in order to, to go ahead with other techniques. <laughs> but, uh, but I think now a 70, 80% success rate for terrecolectin, which is done properly, uh, helps patients over years, is not bad at all. So... Um, it's a combination of things, and, and I think for the time to come, I mean, P Professor Prokosh Willis, Willis was, was asking us what, what will stand the test of time. I'm pretty sure that trabecolectomy will do, even the next 50 years to come. Well, thank you very much. You, uh, you may be biased, and I also should say I that I've learned a lot from you also. So thank you for the many years we spent together and refined that technique. Yeah. But uh, it's true. I mean, we, always want, we all want something better than trabeculectomy, mm. but it's not so bad, as you say, if you do mm. the right technique, if you are persistent, if you have the, uh, the methods of, uh, trouble for troubleshooting, then it's not so bad. And mm. I think we all... <sighs> We, we see very few filtration blabs that are white and melting and so on. So yes, it's a technique and it's a technique that many surgeons can do. And uh, Professor Pandav, you're quite right. I always learn something when I watch other physicians do that, other surgeons do the, yeah. sur the surgery. Yeah. And they're always small things and sometimes big things, yes. Um, and it's a technique that can work everywhere in the world. It's not too expensive, that's also important. May I say uh, thanks, Norbert. I, I would like to uh, to comment on costs because uh, that's been yeah. an issue in all the talks. And when I was in Mainz, uh, I had the fun of calculating the costs of a trabeculectomy. Okay, and that was fifty three euros. Fifty three euros. That's a suture 
That's a little sponge, a little bit of MMC, and you don't need, need you don't need any devices that are cost a thousand euros each. Wherever you go, all devices you can you can put in an eye for glaucoma cost thousand euros. I don't know how much that is in in rupee in your country, but it's I think it's going to be a lot. Very and easy, very easy, yeah. It is very expensive. So from the cost point of view, we also need to consider what what is actually what can we uh, what can we afford in the future, and uh, and we need to take this into consideration. And, and I've been doing this for the past well many many years, and it's 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 sometimes a drag to to convince uh, somebody to to pay that much or health insurance companies that much for a device that is costly, whereas on the other side, there's something that is cheap. Yeah. I, I, was, I was about to say, to say the same thing. I mean, I was asked during this session to talk about mix and will they stand the test of time? And if you look at this lovely trap result, and I'm, I learned from Norbert Pfeiffer as well, and I'm, 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 mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that because the patients are grateful and I always um, have, have his words in my ear saying, do this and this and this, um, that's fine, but, but it, it works so well. And then you have on the other side, as, as Professor Tina has said, the mix, and they're quite costly. And mm -hmm. what do they actually achieve? I mean, it's, it's nice, of course, we want to do new things. We want less risks, like we have, we are feeling the hypotony, we are feeling the super bleeding, one in 500, you could argue. And, um, but it's gonna be difficult for, for any other um, surgical method to overcome the trap and to survive for more than 50 years already. Uh, and it's become better and better. And um, there are new techniques to, to, to deal with hypotony as just presented. And um, so I, I really wonder whether a mix will stand the test of time. I mean. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I'll just comment on that. So the same is true. I'm so happy we spent uh, uh, time together in, in the OR and I also learned a lot. Um, and let, let's just say let, let's just say say that I think it's important we try to improve mix and uh, try to find out mm -hmm. how they can be used. Uh, many will end up at dead end roads, I'm sure. Yeah, and many will not be feasible for many countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we are all the the two speakers here are all Germans, and we are so blessed that there is so money, mm -hmm. so much money available. But this yeah. is not right for the majority of the world's population. I, I mean, uh, so we have mm. to find methods and uh, yeah. well, trabeculectomy is still one. Of course, yeah. oh, uh, operating time is important. The surgeon is important, but it's something that you can teach other people to do. So mm. Mm. we'll not forget about it. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much. I think that was a <clears throat> very good uh, ending uh, sort of point for us that we are still going strong with trivicolectomy and uh, we do need a procedure actually which is can be made available to larger population rather than have a procedure which is you know mm. only limited for whatever reason by the cost or you know skill mm. level required to do that yeah. you know, I think trial has to that time the test of the time uh, so we have to close this session probably at the end. Yes, doctor. Uh, yeah, we have like six minutes left. Uh, does anyone? Uh, you know, may, any may, maybe, maybe as 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 president of of the DOG, which doesn't stand for dog, by the way, it's German <laughs> ophthalmological society. Uh, I'm I'm intrigued, and I'm I'm absolutely delighted. I was delighted to be invited and have, have my co-speakers here for, for our society, and. Uh, let, let's let us repeat this in the future because it worked very nicely. Uh, and and one one thing that the that the pandemic, how how horrible it is, still is has has taught us is that we can interact scientifically, personally, uh, in a manner which I I never dreamt of one and a half years ago. We, I'm just sitting here doing a Zoom conference to Calcutta. Uh, for 14 million people living there, uh, pe people of uh, you told me told us about probably 4,000, 5,000 people watching this, and it's going to be distributed uh, in the YouTube channels. So I'm just overwhelmed. I'm thankful, and and let us repeat this in the future. I I you know I 
give you a warm hug for this uh, <laughs> through the internet. And, and um, it was a delight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Professor Thame. I, I'm president of Glaucoma Society of India. And mm. uh, definitely I'll take your uh, you know, contacts from the AIUS and uh, be in touch mm -hmm. with you and keep you in, you know, uh, informed about the activities, the, the conferences that we have in future, and definitely uh, mm -hmm. like to invite you, you know, for maybe webinars, if not a full conference, we can. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to listening to you. And uh, the first time, I'm very glad that uh, I could join this forum with you and uh, be part of the German ophthalmology glaucoma program on this uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, probably we are ready to say goodbye. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank have you. have bye -bye. a nice, bye -bye. nice bye -bye. conference still. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you care. very much. Bye-bye.